President and General Counsel of Cornell University. I am here today with three members of the National Labor Relations Board. The NLRB is a federal agency created to administer the National Labor Relations Act. The purposes of the act are to protect the rights of workers and their rights to organize. The agency has two separate and distinct functions. And we are fortunate to have representatives of each with us here today. Representing the NLRB, which is a five member panel responsible for adjudicating unfair labor practices, our chairman, Lauren McFerrin, and member, Gwen Wilcox. The general counsel's office is independent from the NLRB and is responsible for investigation and prosecution of unfair labor practice cases, cases and for the general supervision of the NLRB field offices. General Counsel Jennifer Abruzzo is also our guest today. During the first part of the program, the four of us will be discussing our career paths in labor and employment policy and practice and the impact of women leadership in the field. The second part of our program will be an opportunity for you to ask questions of the panelists. Alex Colvin, the Dean of Cornell University's Industrial and Labor Relations School will be moderating the question and answer period. Please note that there is a QR code that will appear on your screen. You should use your phone to scan that code and follow the link to submit questions um, for the Q&A period. This roundtable is sponsored by a grant from the President's Council for Cornell Women. Two other roundtables are scheduled, one in February, featuring academics who, in addition to their teaching and research responsibilities, identify as labor activists. The final roundtable in April will feature women leaders in labor and management relations, including Randy Weingarten, president of the American Federation of Teachers, and Mary Opperman, the vice president of human resources and chief human resources officer for Cornell University. The grant is also sponsoring a fellowship opportunity for Cornell students in labor and employment policy and practice. More information about this fellowship is available at experience.cornell.edu. And when you go to that site, you can use the search for function um, and enter PCCW to find more information about this fellowship. Today's conversation is being recorded and can be viewed at the same URL uh, immediately following today's panel. So welcome, welcome to our panelists. Information about your impressive careers are, is available on the board website and in the eCornell materials for those who want details of your educational achievements and professional background. To get us started, please share how long you have been in your current role and the position that you held immediately before this one. Chairman McBaron, would you please get us started? Absolutely, and thank you for having us all here today. It's quite a pleasure. Um, my name is Lauren McFerrin. I'm the chairman of the National Labor Relations Board. I was first appointed to the board as a board member at the end of 2014, and I served one five-year term as a board member. Um, I was reappointed in the middle of 2020, and for another five-year term, and then was subsequently named the chair um, by President Biden when he took office. Uh, prior to my time at the board, I worked on Capitol Hill for the Senate Committee on Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions. Thank you so much. Member Wilcox? 
Thank you, Donica, and I appreciate um, the invitation as well. Hi, my name is Gwen Wilcox, and I'm, you know, I am. I have to say, I'm, I'm not a stranger to Cornell um, and its ILR school because I previously served at, on the advisory board of the Scheinman Institute. So it's nice to be back. Um, and I was, um, I'm new to the board. I was um, sworn in on August 4th so I, of this year. So I've been in the board member for almost three months now. Um, my prior position, I was a partner at a New York City labor and employment firm, Levy Ratner in New York City. And my term, is, I have a two year term. So my term would end um, in August of 2023. Thank you so much. And General Counsel Abruzzo. Hi there, uh, I'm Jennifer Abruzzo. I'm the General Counsel of the NLRB. Uh, President Biden appointed me in February of this year and after my Senate confirmation, I began my term in on July 22nd. Uh, my prior tenure at the NLRB spanned 23 years from January 1995 through December of 2017, and then uh, between January 2018 until July of this year, I worked at the Communications Workers of America. Wonderful. It's such a pleasure to have each of you here with us today. Um, I have been the Vice President General Counsel for Cornell University for just over four months. And before that, I served as the Vice President General Counsel and Secretary for Oberlin College and Conservatory in Oberlin, Ohio. So it really is a joy to be able to welcome you to Cornell, particularly on this important topic, women leadership in labor and employment practice and policy. Um, we'd like to spend the first part of our conversation today focusing on your paths to your current careers and then discussing the kind of work that you do today. Um, we understand that you're not able to speak specifically to any cases that are before the board, and we hope that our questions will be focused more generally on your career paths um, and the role of women leadership in our chosen field. I'd like to start this first question with uh, General Counsel Abruzzo. Women make up over 57% of the U.S. labor force, of whom about 9% are represented by labor unions. What sparked your interest in labor relations? And have you worked primarily on the union side or management side or both? So thanks for that question. Um, so what sparked my interest truly really was how I grew up. Um, I grew up in a working class family in Queens, New York, um, where both of my parents were union members. Um, one worked at a hospital, the other worked at an electric utility company. And I saw firsthand that having a voice at the workplace and being provided with collectively bargained wages and benefits improved our daily lives and really helped my parents make ends meet. And so at an early age, um, I wanted to ensure that other families were afforded the same opportunities that my family was. Um, and that included, you know, my efforts to promote the rights of workers to engage collectively to improve their workplace lives and encourage collective bargaining. I, um, so that's kind of uh, what sparked my interest at a very young age. Um, I will say that for um, the vast majority of my professional career, I was a neutral uh, working at the NLRB, as I said, um, from January uh, of um, 1995 through uh, December of 2017, and now I'm back again. Um, but there was a brief period of time, uh, three and a half years about where I worked for the Communications Workers of America, um, which is a, a, a tremendous worker advocacy organization. And I uh, truly gained very valuable insights into labor management relations and, and dynamics from an entirely different vantage point. Um, so I hope that answers your question. It does. Thank you so much. 
Um, I would like to um, ask uh, Chairman McFerrin if you could respond to those questions as well, or either one. Sure. Um, in terms of what sparked my interest in, in labor relations, I would say, you know, I when I went to law school, I knew I wanted to do people law, not money law or thing law. That was, but that was kind of the only general direction that I had walking into law school. And um, I took labor and employment courses and found them very interesting. Um, but it was, I, I had not had any, pre, I grew up in Texas. I had not had much previous interaction with unions or with the National Labor Relations Act. And when I did take a traditional labor law course and do a summer associate position at a firm that did traditional labor law work, I really did just fall in love with with labor law and with the, the, the breadth and scope and ambition of the National Labor Relations Act and everything that it has the potential to achieve um, on, on behalf of workers and on behalf of our economy. So I really did, you know, kind of turn an academic interest in labor and employment law into a real love for this particular little arcane statute. But I, when I thought I'd when I told people I was going to go into traditional labor law, they kind of warned me, oh, you, this was 20 years ago. They said, you probably shouldn't do that. It's pretty much a dying field. And I'm pleased to say that they were very, very much wrong and that it could not be a more dynamic or interesting area of the law to be working in right now. Oh, I so agree with you. And it's really interesting to hear um, General Counsel Abruzzo's introduction to the field as part of her family upbringing, your interest being um, sparked while in law school. Member Wilcox, would you please share um, what got you into um, this field? Yes, sure, certainly. I went to law school with the idea that I wanted to represent um, people living in poverty. Um, and, and I did that for four years um, after law school. And I realized that I really was not um, able to change their living situations. Um, I, I felt like I was putting a Band-Aid on a problem, but not really being able to solve the quality of, the, of their lives and the lives of their families. So I decided that I really wanted to, um, I had taken labor law and law school and had some familiarity with NLRB, but not a lot. But I decided that that would be a place that I could go and really learn the act as well and, you know, really understand labor relations. And, you know, and unlike, you know, my legal services clients, you know, there would be opportunities for working people to have better working conditions and benefits, um, which, would, which would benefit themselves and their families, as well as employers and their communities in which they live. And so I worked um, at the board in Region 2 in Manhattan for about five years. And those were really, a, you know, a, a great start for understanding labor law and the, and the challenges. Um, but, you know, but also understanding that collective bargaining was really key to having when unions and workers can really, you know, negotiate contracts um, that benefit themselves, but also maintain, you know, stability for employers and their families as well. So from there, I, um, after five years there, um, I left in 1988, many years ago, and started at um, my firm. Had a different name, but it's it's Levy Ratner now, and um, you know started off representing um, unions, various unions, and that really has um, you know really uh, informed me in terms of the work that I do. But I have to also say that you know one of the motivations I is that um, I recognize how much, you know, how much unions were really important. I have my, my maternal grandfather um, worked in the Youngstown Steel Mills, um, was able to raise his family, um, even though he only had an elementary school education, um, but he was able to support his family. And, um, but on the other hand, I recall my grandmother both my mater my paternal grandmother and my maternal grandmother that they were really strong women who really wanted to have other opportunities and their and work they got jobs that they could get, 
but it wasn't, and they were, didn't have the uh, possibilities of really developing into, I think, this professional women that they probably would have been really successful at. And so that's always been, you know, I, when I think about them, I think about the fact that labor does al allow that opportunity to um, provide opportunities for women in particular, but all working people to have better better lives. And this, you know, and just lastly, um, in terms of, you know, so I was a union lawyer for most of my pro professional career after leaving the board, but I also worked at the um, New York, I volunteered and did public service at the New York City Office of Collective Bargaining, where I served as a neutral. So that has also helped to inform me um, into in this current position. I really do appreciate hearing how you've merged your passion for people um, and work and families into your career. And as you've developed in your career and obtained more um, positions of leadership, can you talk a little bit how you have sought to expand your knowledge about different subject matters um, and develop new skills for managing complex and diverse teams? Maybe you might want to share um, any particular experiences or opportunities that you uh, took advantage of that really prepared you for leadership um, uh, in solving very complex problems and working with um, more and more diverse groups. Um, and if, if you don't mind, um, Chairman McFerrin, uh, I'm sorry, I think I asked you to start the last one. So I will, I will go to... Um, uh, General Counsel Bruzo to lead us here. So thank oh, actually, you. I, I got that wrong. This is this is yours to lead, uh, Chairman McFerrin. So if you can start <laughs> us off, that'd be great. Um, so the question is um, how I ex how experiences have built leadership skills. Is th is that or absolutely so. Well, you know, I, I would imagine um, as you have achieved greater success in your career um, in positions of more um, authority and leadership and influence, the problems that you're solving with teams have become a lot more complex and you're dealing with more diverse groups of people. Mm -hmm. And I'd be interested in knowing and uh, how you have developed your skill set to manage more complex problems and deal with more diverse groups? Mm -hmm. um, well, I, I think certainly I've taken a lot of lessons. I, as, as you, I believe you mentioned previously, um, I, I worked on Capitol Hill um, for, two, for two very different, but both very um, 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 real role models for me. Um, both Ted Kennedy and Tom Harkin um, were, were, were the two senators that chaired the committee that I worked for when I was there. And I think they taught me a great deal about leadership and about bringing voices to the table. Um, I, I would particularly highlight um, Senator Harkin, who is known, of course, as a champion in, in the disability advocacy community. Um, and his you know, his, you know, modeling behavior of bringing authentic voices to any discussion and bringing authentic voices to the table and um, not having conversations ab about a topic unless you are elevating the voices of the people most affected by the conversation that you're having and making space in the conversation for those most affected by what you're having. That's a lesson that from Senator Harkin that I've always taken taken away from that and tried to bring to um, to you know conversations that I'm convening and to decision making processes that I'm in charge of. Um, I'm, I'm sure Gwen and Jennifer though also have excellent perspectives on this. Yes, please jump in either um, Member Wilcox or General Counsel Bruzo. Well, I would say, um, and I, you know, I, I appreciate um, um, Lauren's um, response um, because I think it is important to um, figure out how do you, um, you know, become more effective when you're in positions um, as we, you know, as we professionally develop over time. Um, and I would say that I made, um, I, I, you know, I, one of the things I would say is that I've learned to um, be open to possibilities. Um, and so 
the work that I, I, you know, the work that I did working at, um, at the board and before, and also at my firm, my former firm, you know, I feel like I always did think that there was more outside the doors of my office, that there was, you know, even though I interacted with lots of clients and really appreciated um, the interaction um, of, of, you know, I wouldn't say collective bargaining, hearings, you know, all the things that, you know, labor lawyers do, but I also felt like I needed to have a broader perspective. And so I, you know, I really had the opportunity once to speak at the American Bar Association, a midwinter meeting that specializes and looks at the developing, um, at the NLRA. And, um, you know, from there, I really thought that there was an opportunity for me to really understand the um, NLRA better and really to interact with um, colleagues um, on, you know, at the, with who work at the NLRB, um, management lawyers, as well as union lawyers. And I would say probably that hands down, that's probably been one of the most um, rewarding experiences and not really realizing how that really has enhanced my um, professional development um, to be able to, you know, understand the law, be able to understand what the other side is thinking and really having meaningful discussions um, with government, uh, you know, board members and other senior leadership of the board, um, as well as other union lawyers. Um, so I really had, a, I probably really deepened my, um, in my understanding of even my own practice and what are, the, what are some of the possibilities and skills that I could develop. And so as, um, you know, I'm always the person who likes to um, share information. And so I've, you know, I've, over my over time, I've had, I've been mentored by many people. Um, I wouldn't say I've had uh, one particular person. I've had several people who've mentored me over time. But more importantly, I, I have mentored a lot of younger lawyers, um, more younger in terms of experience level. Um, and that has been probably one of the most rewarding parts of, of what I couldn't, I've been able to contribute to them, but also what I, I've gotten more from mentoring than I'm sure that I could possibly give to them. And so that really helped me in terms of my firm, I think in terms of working with um, other lawyers within the firm, um, younger lawyers, newer lawyers in the office. Um, and so I hope that, you know, in that way, that, to me, I, I certainly learned a lot and I think it, it has really broadened my experience. And then lastly, I've been very committed to diversity issues um, you know, I'm often the only person of color in the room in many, in many ways. Um, I mean, I fortunately represented a union that was uh, made up of a lot of black and brown women. Um, so that wasn't always the case. But in terms of the lawyer, I was often the only person of, of color. And so, you know, I realized that it's, you know, it's a lo it can be lonely, but if you invite other people to, part you know, to want to get excited about labor law, um, and, you know, the, then we can have, a, you know, we can have more people at the table um, who really reflect um, the, the you know, people in this country, what our, you know, our de demographics of our country. Um, and so that has also, I think, enhanced my um, understanding of why it's important to, um, you know, both me, for me on a professional basis, but also how we can improve the, the profession. Thank you. Yeah, and I think I'll just echo really what Lauren and Gwen have said. I, I, I my most significant experience have, have similarly been internal and external relationship building and mentorships that I certainly took full advantage of, and I believe they've benefited me greatly through my not only professional development but my personal development as well. And um, you know, as as Gwen mentioned, I. I am committed to paying that forward, and um, I try to serve as a role model and a mentor or a sounding board or <laughs> for the many very talented and committed younger professionals in particular who may seek my engagement with them in, in whatever capacity they choose to. Um, and as Gwen said, I, I, I completely agree. I think 
it's as much about learning from them as it is about imparting whatever quote wisdom that I that they may want from me. Uh, and and I do consider life to just be one long learning journey. And certainly, I have gotten a you know tremendous amount of. Um, knowledge and um, perspectives from, you know, the, both being mentored and mentoring others. So thanks for each of you for uh, sharing your perspectives. I, I heard things about seeking out diverse and authentic voices and inviting them into the conversation and your own individual passions for learning and engagement and through one-on-one -on -one mentoring and group mentoring. So I'd like with that background to switch and let's talk about your career journey. And oftentimes um, pathways to leadership are not always linear and they're not always upward. Would you share a career decision that you made that may have been unconventional or a setback that you experienced? And what did you learn from that? And I won't call on anyone in particular. I will let you all decide who would, if, if that question speaks to you. Yeah. Um, well, and, I can, um, sure. I mean, I can, I can start. Um, I think what I initially say is um, setbacks are really opportunities, right? And I certainly treat them as such. So I will give um, two examples quickly. One personal example. Uh, and then one professional one, but they, they um, but, but but they both answer the question, I think. Uh, so on a personal level, I was uh, a single mom and worked at, during the day and, and went to law school in the evening. And as you could well imagine, the pickings for, for night school, uh, the course pickings were slim and many of the classes that I was interested in taking um, uh, uh, were not offered to me uh, at night. So I asked my evidence professor, who also taught labor law during the day, if I could help him with a law review article that he was working on um, for credit. And he agreed. Uh, and so we collaborated on that. Uh, he ultimately became a good friend of mine and a great mentor to me. And, and actually, unsolicited by me, he uh, put my name forward when he was contacted by the head of the NLRB's Miami office, uh, who was looking to, to hire, you know, a new law school graduate. And that's how I got my foot in the door at the NLRB and the rest is history. But, but the point is, is that, you know, I, I, I seized an opportunity as opposed to just, you know, um, kind of, dealt with the the cards that I was handed and um, and and I think that that's like a that's going to be my theme throughout the this program is you know seizing opportunities and and not considering things to be setbacks um, but but really using them as opportunities um, similarly on a professional level um, you know I thought I would remain with the NLRB for my entire career and because the NLRB was a family to me, and I had been there for a very long time, but but elections have consequences. And after the Trump-appointed general counsel came on board to the agency, I found myself looking for a new job, um, which I truly never envisioned happening. But fortunately for me, um, the Communications Workers of America, which, as I said, you know, is a is a great union and advocate for workers' rights hired me on and I, I learned a great deal about, you know, ground level organizing efforts and about good faith collective bargaining acti activities at the table, you know, firsthand. Uh, and that experience is certainly a to my benefit and hopefully to the workers benefits now that I'm back at the agency. And so I just say, you know, I put myself out there, I took risks, um, I turned challenges into opportunities and you know I would recommend that for others. Thanks so much. Member Wilcox or Chairman McBaron, would you like to weigh in on that question? So I, I would say a few. Um, I don't know that it's exactly answering your question but um, I, when I went to college I was a social work major, um, was always committed to wanting to you know help to make a difference in people's lives 
And so I was going to be a social worker. I was very happy with that prospect. But then um, my last internship made me realize that I there were restrictions. So this shows how how long ago this was that I was working, I was doing an internship where I worked with, um, with children who had either been, had been abandoned by their families um, or had severe um, medical problems and disabilities, and they were living in a state hospital. And um, at that time, there was the agency I was working for, a not-for-profit, um, wanted to try to make arrangements so these young children would have the opportunity to um, attend Head Start programs. And so there were, you know, there was a lot of writing about this, but ultimately there were restrictions on their ability to be able to leave an institution to, to then, you know, um, go to a Head Start program. And so I realized, you know, no matter what we could do really as solely as a social worker, yes, we could advocate, but we wouldn't be able to, um, you know, be able to really change the laws without there being, you know, you know, legislation. So that kind of whet my appetite in terms of wanting to go to law school in the kind of in a very general sense that I thought that, you know, this is something I want to do. So I actually, you know, at first was disappointed that, um, that I that, that maybe social work wasn't going to be the field for me, but I but I you know I'm grateful for having had that internship that really got me to apply to law school and that you know as I mentioned before I really wanted to work with um, which with um, people who were living in poverty and you told, I told the rest of the story already but you know I think that um, I, I take from that I recognize the fact that. It's really important to be open to possibilities, um, and um, certainly my um, being, the fact that I was, you know, nominated by President um, Biden um, for a position at the NLRB was really open. You know, was you know really thinking about you know opening, being open to possibilities because I was not it was not something I was looking for at the time, um, but. Um, yes, elections have consequences, and I thought that I, you know, based upon my experience, it was something that I really, you know, could not, I could, it was an offer that I could not refuse. So I say that it's really important to think about being open to possibilities and not thinking about, oh, well, this was not exactly what my plan was. If I had a plan, this wasn't what I was thinking of, but just to think about you know, what this really means. And I think along the way of so many things that um, I've, you know, things that, you know, a lot of the professional opportunities I've had, you know, really was about being open to those possibilities. So I would say to anyone, you know, don't be closed minded. If you think about the fact that you, you know, should you do something, don't say no until you've spoken to five people who can give you other perspectives. Um, um, about and don't talk to people who are going to give you the answers you want to hear, but talk to other people who will challenge you, um, because that's really important. Um, you don't have to agree with them, but you should think of it. Should give you something to think about before you say no, and don't say no. I love that advice. Say yes and consult <laughs> with people who will help you think through how to get to that yes. Chairman McFerrin, would you like to um, comment on this question about setbacks or opportunities? I guess maybe not directly on setbacks or opportunities, but and not to 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 pivot away from the, the excellent message that Member Wilcox said. And I, I would add that, you know, my a couple of experiences that I've had have led me to conclude that sometimes it's okay to say no or to do what's not the expected thing for you to do, um, and to trust that that's not going to derail. Your, your derail all of your professional development. I had, when I had, when I had a, my, when my younger child was three weeks old, I was presented with an, a, what would have been in any other circumstance, a wonderfully exciting professional opportunity. And it would have made sense and checked a number of boxes and, uh, you know, anyone in the outside world would have not, would have, would have thought this was an excellent thing for me to do. And I 
I was sitting there on the couch kind of you know, trying to manage what had become this, this new life that I had. And I, I realized that it was okay for me to say no. And it was okay for me to listen to myself and to trust that some other opportunity would come along at some point that would provide me with uh, you know, enriching opportunities and opportunities to work with wonderful people. And that it was okay to not do this because many people would have seen this as the expected next thing for me to do. And sure enough, you know, six months later, when I was in a better place and my life was in a better place and things were in a little more control, another opportunity came along. And, and that it was okay to say no when it wasn't the right, when, when I, to listen mm -hmm. to yourself and to say that this, this wasn't the right opportunity for me at that time and to trust that I could, you know, find a, a different path that would lead me also to an enriching place. Mm -hmm. All of you have shared such wonderful wisdom, right? The ability to see a challenge as an opportunity, um, the ability to overcome your fears and look for new opportunities, and also the importance of listening to yourself and being authentic to your priorities at a particular time and trusting that other opportunities might come along. So thank you so much for sharing all of that. I'd like to go back to member Wilcox who shared earlier um, about her experience as often being the first or the only woman of color in certain spaces that she's in. And I, that I have had a similar experience in, in my career. And I'm still struck by the fact in 2021 um, that many of us are still making history as, as the first or the only. How have you navigated systems of influence and power um, that have been male dominated or lacking in diversity when you showed up in those spaces with your authentic self? Any advice that you can share? Yes, um, thank you for the question, um, and I'll try to answer to the best of my ability. I will say that, you know, I, I, this past year has made me really have to think about my past in the different ways, and I've had to think about it, um, especially with, you know, so much, you know, discussion about the fact that I'm the first black woman to serve in, in the, on the National Labor Relations Board. And it's made me really kind of think about, you know, well, how did this happen? Um, how am I going to deal with this? And, you know, and so one of the things I do want to share with you is the fact that I, um, going back to fourth grade, and um, Jennifer, I guess I grew up in Queens as well. And um, I was bused from my community to an all-white community in in, in Queens, um, actually, interesting. My school was not all black. It was definitely a very. It was an integrated school, but um, the idea was that I would get a better education. Um, and so I went into a school where they only had they only um, had three black young black children, two girls and a boy, um, transferred to an all white school. So there were none of the teachers looked like me. The none of the the principal, of course, did not look like me. The custodians, no one was in the school. It's just the three of us going there, and so I feel like in many ways um, that kind of prepared me to, and sadly, to work in the legal profession, um, because you know I was used to being in a room, so, you know, with other people um, who didn't look like me. But you know I got a great education. Um, I, you know, definitely, um, you know, had, I feel like I had good um, friendships within the class, but I lived so far away that there wasn't possibilities for really socializing after school. It was just, this is before there were play dates, but, um, you know, it just didn't happen. But um, the reality is that, um, sorry, it, it, the reality is that it did not happen that, um, you know, I think I realized that I had to make, what do I have to, what did I have to do? I had to learn how to get along with people who didn't look like me and also to realize that 
I had to try to figure out how to bridge the gap. You know, I was new to them. They were new to me. So I think in many ways that's really helped me to hear, like, how do I walk into a room constantly, whether it was in law school, whether it was, you know, in my working, um, in various jobs, you know. And I guess I would say a couple of things. One, I feel like you have to find, you know, you try to find someone who, people that you're going to, who you'll get to know. I mean, you know, it's like, you know, maybe it'll be one person who will, be nice to you and you find some, you make some type of connection and, you know, kind of build upon that, you know, and I think it's important. I think we've said it's like, you know, it's important to have a a support system outside of whatever your work environment is, you know, to have friends, family, colleagues who can, you know, that, you know, when things like you say, how am I going to do this? the, The situation is challenging but you can talk with them. I mean, I am fortunate and grateful that my mom was a person who had so much wisdom and she worked in academia. Um, She, you know, she counseled students as well um, in her, in in her assistant dean position. So, you know, I had the benefit of someone who really could, you know, make me realize, okay, yes, you can do this. But, you know, there were times you needed to talk to other people as well. But I think it's important to find whoever that person, persons can be that make you, that can give you the support you know, system. Um, and, you know, I really thought that, um, you know, to the extent you can bring other people into the room, um, it's important to try to do that, you know, and so we talk about mentorship, you know, we talk about encouraging others um, to be able to follow suit um, because, you know, it, you know, I, you know, I, I feel like that's something that's really important that it's like on us so that we want, we're not in the room, whether it's being the only woman in the room, or only person of color, um, you know, we, we that we should try to do what we can do. What, what, what can we do on our, on our own way to be able to bring um, more people um, into the into the room? And I guess, and then lastly, I would say that um, you know, as a you know, as a board member in this position, I don't know that you really asked me this, but I want to say is that it's really important. I mean, for me, I want I, I hope that I'm an inspiration to other women to other black and brown women, to indigenous people, that it's really important that, you know, I, that I feel like it's, I'm, I appreciate the opportunity to be, to participate in this program and for all three of us to participate in this program, as well as you, Donica, because it's really important to get this message out here that, you know, we don't want to be the only ones. We don't want to be, we, we want to have, you know, have more and more people and to be, you know, and that we hopefully will inspire others to, others to do that. And, you know, and I think that with the National Labor Relations Board, um, you know, so many people don't even know what we do. I mean, I worked at the NLRB, you know, before friends and family, and they still ask me, what do I, what's the NLRB? What, what is this? What do they do? It's not that, no, it's not the Department of Labor. We have, so, you know, I really feel like that's one thing that, you know, is really important. And I hopefully this attention to the three of us at the board will help to have the public know more and more about what the NLRB does. And that, you know, we, I truly believe that, um, you know, the the board and other agencies um, should reflect the country and demographics in which we live. Um, so I hope that the inspire, you know, that we inspire more and more young people um, to, you know, f- follow their dreams, recognize what the possibilities are and just go for it. Thank you. You are inspiring and we appreciate your (laughs) pioneering efforts. Um, And um, we are going to talk a little bit about your current roles, but if either Chairman McFerrin or General Counsel Abruzzo would like to speak to this question, I'd love to hear how you've navigated traditionally male-dominated spaces um, um, in your work. Um, So if if you would like to share, we'd love to hear hear your your thoughts on on this topic. So Lauren, why don't you go first, since I went, you went last last time. <laughs> um, I mean, I guess one thing that was, that, that was where I, was, I felt like I was playing kind of a role of a first at the board, at least a, probably a, a, the first that I know of, is 
coming to a role on the board as a parent of young children. Um, I, I, the, the, being on the board is traditionally more of a role that people tend to take a little later in, 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 in their career. Mm -hmm. I think it was, I was the first board member, to my knowledge, or at least the first one in a very long time, that had, you know, I, I had a, a seven-month-old baby when I came to the board. My older son was four, um, you know, preschool age children. And so um, one thing I tried to do is bring my whole self to the workplace because if I as a board member could bring my whole self to the workplace then others could bring their whole mm -hmm. selves to the workplace if I can be in a board meeting and say I need a 15 minute break because I've got to go pump if I can be in a meeting and say I'm sorry it's 5 30 this meeting was supposed to end at five and my daycare charges me five dollars a minute starting at six o'clock I'll give you a call you know or can we reconvene tomorrow I think if I can say that, then hopefully other people can say that. And so I've mm -hmm. always tried to be very open about kind of the, the challenges that navigating being a working parent of young children can present with the hopes that if I'm visible about that, then others can be visible about that as well. That's nice. Yeah, thank you so That's much. That's a really good sharing. point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so all I would really add to this is that going back to, to – to what we've all been saying before. I mean, I, I was fortunate enough to have both female and male champions who were secure enough in their own skin to recognize the value that I added. Um, I, so I didn't have as much of um, an issue with male-dominated uh, um, systems. I had more of an issue with regard to generational biases um, because I had confidence in myself and I, you know, treated people with the respect that I would want and I built relationships and I worked hard and I absorbed as much knowledge as I could and I put myself out there for, you know, promotional opportunities um, uh, because I, I wanted to make a greater impact and I... Uh, you know, got those promotional opportunities and got those promotions at a very young age. And that was more tricky for me to navigate than the male versus, you know, the male dominated kind of power structure because I was often, and I'm actually curious to know if Lauren and Gwen had this experience as well, but, you know, it was more tricky to navigate the, oh, you know, you haven't been around long enough, or you don't have the experience I we do, or um, this is the way we've always done it, you know, come back to us 10 years from now. That was more tricky. And so, you know, again, you show them what you've got, you have confidence in yourself, and, you know, at, and ultimately, you get the respect back, or if, if not the respect, um, at least they're, they're willing to listen and put your ideas into practice. So great. Um, General Counsel Bruzo, I'd like to stay with you um, with, for this next question um, and explain what do you do as General <laughs> Counsel of the NLRB? And so we're going to ask each of our panelists Tell everyone, what is it that you do? What is a typical day like? And what do you love about your job? Sure. So so this is, um, well, yeah, we could talk about this forever. But but um, as you know, the, the board is bifurcated between the board side, which is, as you mentioned, the adjudicatory and, and more recently rulemaking body. And then there's the general counsel side. And my role as general counsel is to have broad oversight over the investigation of cases and the prosecution of uh, statutory violations uh, and over the, the processing of elections. Um, I will say that those functions are predominantly performed in the field by our very capable board agents. Uh, and I would say that that work makes up over 90% of what the agency does writ large. Um, and I also, as, as general counsel, have um, general oversight over the administrative, financial, and operational aspects of the agency. Um, I, I would say that um, my goals are to educate and protect and enforce the statute to the best of my ability. And the best part of my day is engaging with 
our cadre of really talented board agents to help me do that. Um, I, it is really important to me and I know to the other board agents and I know to, to Lauren and Gwen as well that workers know their rights and employers and unions know their obligations under our statute. And I see way too often how vulnerable workers are exploited by their employers uh, and how the lack of a voice at the table has significant impacts, if not dire consequences, for workers and their families and their communities, particularly right now during the, the, the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and so, you know, again, it's really important for me to, for workers in this country to know about our agency, to know about what rights we protect, and, that, and to know that to the extent that those rights are violated, we will aggressively pursue all remedies that is available. Thank you so much. Chairman McFerrin, you've had a long, impressive <laughs> career at the NLRB. Um, and um, to friends and family of member Wilcox and yours, um, can you tell everyone what you do um, and why you love your job? Absolutely. Um, so the, the role of the board um, is, of course, you know, different than, than the role of the general counsel. Obviously, Jennifer and I work very closely together on various agency administration issues and things like that. But when it comes, you know, the, the general counsel is, is an advocate and um, is, is, is attempting to shape a, a, a vision of the law. Um, and um, the board is an adjudicator. And um, we are attempting to, you know, kind of um, figure out a way to resolve the cases that are brought before us in the manner that is most consistent with the law. And, um, you know, I guess my job is a lot of, and, and the, the other you know, kind of key distinction is, of course, that the board is a five-member entity. And as chair, while I am, you know, kind of the administrative head of the board side of the agency, and um, I, you know, I, the board members are, are five, uh, I'm one among equals uh, of, as, as a board member. And so part of my job is to kind of shepherd a collective decision-making process among a body of five people who often have very different perspectives, even amongst, you know, people who are of the same party sometimes, but certainly um, given it's a bipartisan board who often have very different perspectives on what the right answer is under the law and how to kind of how to keep the board's decision making process moving forward and help us, you know, help have us making decisions in an efficient manner that just serves the public, given this structure and the way that we're built. Um, so I, I, find, I actually find that aspect of the job very you know, fascinating is how does how does this group of five people find a path forward to get the parties in this case the decision that they deserve in a timely manner, and that's the challenge and the reward of of the job for me. And I I'm sure Gwen as a, as a as a as a new board member might have a very different perspective. But well, that's great because we'd love to hear Member Wilcox's <laughs> perspective on this. Well, I I um. You know, I, you know, uh, Lauren, I, I agree with, you know, everything that you say, and I say hats off to you as uh, chairman, because there is, um, you know, you have a, a lot of the administrative issues that you have to deal with, and also trying to uh, herd five people to uh, to consensus is, uh, is, can be challenging at times. Um, so I don't really have much more to add other than to say that, you know, my, my first three months have been really great. Um, I'm happy to have returned to such a great agency. I enjoyed it when I was there and I'm glad to be back. Um, I do keep, you know, as I said earlier, I really do keep in mind and, you know, the forefront of my mind with any decisions that I have to make that the, how, that these decisions impact, you know, the lives of people. Um, you know, employees and unions and employers and their families and their communities. And, um, you know, so I, you know, that's something that I will always stick with me um, as I, you know, make decisions that it's, and as Lauren said, it's really important to, you know, think about how we can move cases in a timely fashion because these are, they are impacting people's lives. Um, and, um, you know, it's, I, 
and it's you know it's really quite fascinating the, all the kinds of the different industries um, and the um, you know different work settings um, that make it really um, quite fascinating. Um, and so um, it's there's never a dull moment, I would say, in terms of the cases that come be, before us. Um, but I also want to just you know really say that the staff of the board and the agency are just so oh, stellar, so committed to the work of the agency, um, you know, just so smart and just, you know, the dedication is just, uh, you know, just so encouraging. And that's, I'm really, um, you know, it's it's been great to see that. And not that I expected anything less, but it's been, you know, for me being so new, returning to the agency in this position, you know, it really has helped in, in terms of the, tra you know, the transition, making things easy, uh, much easier. And I have to give a shout out to my staff who are, you know, I, you know, I don't, we get to talk about cases and we try to do a call every other week so we can, you know, I can get to know them and they can get to know me because um, it's so strange to start a job and everyone's working remotely. Um, but I am so happy that um, I get to work with such, you know, dedicated professionals and just wonderful people. So I have a great, you know, it's, it's a great position and I'm enjoying it. So um, I will, um, you know, hope, you know, and I, you know, and I, you know, to work with Jennifer and, um, and Lauren is, is indeed a, a pleasure. Well, thank you so much. I have one final question before Dean Colvin joins um, the panel to facilitate the Q&A. And for the participants of this webinar, hopefully you have had a chance to scan the QR code and submit your questions. We look forward to inviting your uh, participation in the last uh, half of this or 30 minutes of this um, webinar. So, um, Media reports of NLRB decisions or general counsel memos often trigger on highly contentious matters. And to some who are not familiar with the NLRB or the role of the general counsel, um, it could appear um, that the decisions are really influenced by partisan politics. How do you respond to that level of critique? Jennifer, you want to start here and I'll chime in? Or? Um, sure. I, I think what I would say is, you know, uh, and what I ha how I have responded to this question is that, you know, I was a neutral for most of my professional career. Uh, and so I will continue to act in a neutral capacity. But I, but I certainly think that our agency is an advocate for workers, certainly on the general counsel side, as, as, as Lauren mentioned earlier in that we are ensuring that workers' rights are protected and that violators of those rights are prosecuted and that violations of those rights are, are fully remedied. And so I, you know, think that, and of course you bring with you, as I said at the very beginning, you know, your own perspectives on, on matters. And, and I ultimately think my upbringing helped shape my perspective that having a voice in the workplace through representatives, if workers so choose, helps families and communities not only survive, but thrive. So that's how I would answer that sort of partisan uh, question and how I have answered it in the past. I do just want to say one thing that I, I um, forgot to mention earlier, which is, I am very happy to report, I, first of all, I believe that there's been a shift in gender-based attitudes regarding leaders. Um, and I'm really happy to report that we at the agency now have many more female regional directors who are the senior leaders in our mm -hmm. field offices than male to a two to one ratio. So two thirds of our senior leaders in the field now are female to one third male. And of course, you know, we have a female general counsel and a female uh, chairperson. So, so the times, uh, they are a changing. Thank you so much. Uh, Chairman McBearn, we will let you have the last word in this segment of our, our panel. 
Certainly. And yes, I mean, it's a perennial, I, I believe, kind of, you know, political journalism critique of the board to say that the board, you know, varies with the political winds. I mean, the statistic that I always give in response to that is to note that for if you look across decades, the decisions of the board are consistently between 70 and 90 percent unanimous, completely unanimous. Um, and that's what I think people lose sight of when they're talking about the board. There are a few high profile cases that reflect genuine, you know, genuinely held differences in the appropriate interpretation of our statute. But the vast majority of the cases that we deal with at the board are not precedent setting cases, are not novel issues of law, are not even controversial issues of law. They are straightforward applications of our you know, statute that's been around for you know, decades and decades and decades now. And the vast majority of the time, the board agrees about the correct interpretation of that statute and the, the, the correct way that the case should turn out. And this is, and to some extent, that's the real business of the board. I mean, the real business of the board, both, you know, in, in Jennifer's shop where there's, you know, they're settling the vast majority of cases that come to them. But even, even when things get to our point, the real business of the board is resolving these straightforward disputes, these collective bargaining disputes, these, you know, kind of one person was terminated, you know, multiple people, you know, were, were terminated and making sure that justice under our statute is done there. And the vast majority of that time, that's not a controversial proposition. And that's the real work of the agency. Right. And if you don't mind, Donick, I just, just real briefly, I would like to just add to what Lauren said, you know, of all, just to get to put everything into perspective, of all the cases that are filed with us, two thirds of them are dismissed or withdrawn in the field and a third are found to have merit. And of the third that are found to have merit, as Lauren just mentioned, over 90% of those settle in the field offices. And so they never get to the board for any sort of adjudication at all. And so you're looking at a very small subset of cases that actually get to the board. And then as Lauren said, you know, the vast majority of that very small subset have unanimous decisions and, and, and you know, the, the, the board is able to, to function quite well. And it's, it's just a very, very small, small group where there's any real controversy. But of course, that's the, you know, that's what gets the press. Well, thank you so much. And I would like to now invite Dean Colvin um, to join us on screen. I think he is there. And I will turn the, this program over to his capable hands. Thank you so much. No, thank you very much. And it's a real pleasure to be here with this uh, amazing panel. Um, and to kick off, uh, uh, we're going to be answering uh, some questions from the audience. So uh, keep coming uh, with those questions. Uh, use the QR code. You can pop those in um, as we go along. But just to start off with, uh, we are in the era of uh, remote work. Uh, this is the uh, the term of the last year and a half. And you are the, uh, the board that deals with the central issue in the world of work. But you yourselves are doing virtual uh, hearings. Uh, you're using these virtual tools yourself. So um, uh, I was wondering if you would comment on how that's, uh, how that's worked, the pluses, the minuses, perhaps, for the work of the board. Um, uh, Chairman McFerrin, do you want to maybe start uh, on that question? Well, I'll start with that question just to say, I think under the circumstances, like many government agencies, under the circumstances, I feel like we have done the best job we can. Um, Obviously, pivoting to re I, I, pivoting to entirely remote hearings was not something anyone ever anticipated that we would have to do. In terms of our agency procedures, it's kind of putting a square peg in a round hole, and we had to figure out as we went along how to try to make this work. Um, and, I, and I think, like my overall perspective, would be to commend the people at our agency who have gone above and beyond and started doing their work much differently than they've normally done it. Um, and we, our technology staff has been amazing in trying to help us find new ways to get the business of the agency done. It's never been ideal, um, but I do just genuinely commend all of the people of the agency who've been creative and who've been thoughtful and who've, you know, under not great circumstances. Well, of course, bearing in mind that there's a lot of other stuff going on in everybody's lives and you're trying to kind of pivot at work and how you do business well, you have, like I, I mean, you have 
people who are sick and kids who aren't going to school and you have all this other life stuff going on, the elderly parents who you know, need care and, you know, I just, to, you know, a huge, huge, you know, respect for everyone at our agency who's been nav- navigating and balancing so much while at the same time trying to help keep the mission of the agency moving forward. Like I said, it, it, I, it's certainly, it's not ideal for an agency like ours that does so much business and so much of our, our work, at least particularly on Jennifer's side, so I'll turn things over to her, is interacting with and speaking with the public. But um, I think from an agency management perspective, we've kind of done the best we can in not great circumstances. Yeah, John, Councilor Bruzzo, yeah, uh, for your part of the agency, I mean, this must really affect how you do the work pretty dramatically. Yes, I mean, I, I'd echo what Lauren said. I think our board agents have done a tremendous job under the circumstances, and certainly I think we've done, you know, the best we could in effectuating the, the mission. But, you know, certain by, you know, using the virtual tools that have been afforded us, but certainly, as you could well imagine, it's not the best effectuation of the mission when you cannot engage in person with witnesses, for example, who you're trying to take affidavits from in order to garner, you know, sufficient information during investigations to make an informed decision. And oftentimes through that personal interaction, you build up a rapport, the witness starts to feel less anxious and starts to trust you more and you typically elicit much more relevant information through in-person interactions and sim- and the same for you know witness prep it, it's much better to be able to do that you know in person and similarly and I can tell you from experience um, when I was not with the agency over the past um, year uh, I was involved in a virtual hearing. It was a our case hearing, but it's not as good. It's not the same. And in a non-fair labor, you know, there's technology issues. There's sh- screen sharing and document share, and you know, everything's delayed. And you know, there's issues of who's seeing what. And, and then, frankly, there's also and who is better at technology than others. Um, but on top of that, in unfair labor practice hearings, in particular. I think it's been, I mean, I can't speak for the ALJs, but I will, (laughs) in that I would imagine it's been very difficult to make credibility determinations and assess demeanor when you're really not able to see that person, you know, Mm -hmm. in front of you. And, and frankly, you don't, you don't know who else may or may not be in the room, Uh, what they may or may not have before them, you know, reviewing. So it's certainly, while we did the best we could, and I truly applaud the board agents for, for, for going above and beyond and doing anything and everything that they could to fully effectuate the mission. It's just not, it's not, not as good in my opinion. So I'm hoping that, you know, obviously health and safety is extremely important Uh, And Lauren and I have been engaging on this and engaging with our internal unions and engaging with our staffs just about, you know, how we can better effectuate the mission while ensuring that our our staffs are are safe and healthy. So so it's a work in progress. But 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 we the plan is to reenter the workforce at at some point soon so that we can not only, you know, um, do in-person investigations and, and litigation uh, and elections, which, you know, when you have mail ballot elections, it certainly delays uh, the, the time within which um, unions either get certified or they don't. Um, and, but also in-person is extremely important, as, as we mentioned earlier, to engage with the public and educate the public and workers and communities and their employers and unions about what we do. You could do it by Zoom and we have, or other other tools, and we have, we've done that. But again, um, in-person is, is, is the best way to go. So we've got a question from one of our students uh, uh, on the audience uh, from Member Wilcox. Um, uh, question is, as a grad student planning to attend law school, what type of advice would you give to a young woman of color pursuing a career in labor law? I know uh, law school is certainly an intimidating experience for everyone, but uh, uh, what advice may you have for that student uh, with the question? 
Well, I would say that it's important to investigate the law schools that still have labor law courses um, because many um, the law schools do not have it, unfortunately. So it really would be important to identify a school that does have labor law or you know employment law courses, um, you know, as for starters. Um, and then also many of the, school, um, the schools do have um, labor and employment law societies. Um, it'd be good to know whether that, you know, that school has that. Um, and just what the student, um, you know, and what other student organizations that might be, um, you know, similar ilk um, that where they could learn more about, you know, labor law. And, you know, to the extent that there are opportunities to do um, um, to find out whether they have any clinics. Um, there are some clinics that do, you know, some employment related, um, have em employment related issues. Um, the, um, the NLRB, um, you know, from time to time has internship programs. Um, so it would be good to be in the city or um, where um, there's an NLRB office um, where you might have the possibility to um, work with um, you know, to internship at, to do internships. Um, so I think a little, you know, some research in terms of, you know, wh where, the, where you might want to go, where um, there are, uh, additionally, just, um, you know, in terms of where there are, you know, a lot of like union density, um, you know, um, the, you know, the Northeast is very um, dense, um, California and, you know, some places in Chicago, you know, the Midwest area and, you know, and, 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 play, and so there's a lot of organizing going on as I read. Um, so just, you know, just to try to figure out, you know, you know, what geographic area that might be helpful so that you can have internships, at, you know, in, you know, various places where you could learn labor law and, and enhance your educational experience. Just to pick up one of the earlier comments, it's always striking to me that, you know, even though, you know, there's certainly been the decline in percentage of workers represented by unions, we are still talking about 15 million American workers, and that's an enormous um, uh, number of people needing representation. And so that there are career opportunities in labor law, I think, that are sometimes under uh, underestimated that the, the importance and, and amount of the work that's still out there to do. Uh, Another career-related question, this one for uh, General Counsel Abruzzo. Uh, what advice would you give to women who are currently looking to change careers starting out with the NLRB at an entry-level position? So a, more of a career-changing question. Let me just make sure I understand. So a career-changing where they want to come to the NLRB? Okay. Yes. Yeah, so I, I fully embrace that. I love it. I mean, I think it's so important, as was said earlier, that we get perspectives from all different types of people in all different places in their lives. And certainly, you know, folks that have done something for a period of time that then just decide to come to the board, bring that experience with them and only enhance the, the um, you know, the, the workplace that they're going to go into. I will just say, um, so I embrace it. I welcome it. Please do. The field offices in particular are great great way to um, engage with the public, to be there on the front lines. You do everything from investigations to litigation to, if you're a lawyer, to um, conducting elections, to handling um, interagency coordination, to immigration issues, to outreach. So there's a penelope of of things that you can do in any field office, and we've got 48 of them around the country. Um, I would also just note that we just put out our solicitation for our honors program. And so if folks are interested in becoming honors attorneys at the agency, um, there are opportunities there, both in the field and in headquarters, and in headquarters both on the general counsel side, where there is um, mission critical legal support divisions, as well as on board side, on all the board staffs and on representation appeals and the solicitor's office. So there's there's many opportunities at the board. It depends on you know what you're interested in doing. I would say certainly if you're a people person and you really are interested in being on the front lines, certainly consider 
a um, field office. If you are more of a researcher, writer, analytical um, individual, you might want to consider uh, a headquarters position either on board side or on GC side in like the Division of Advice, for example, or, or the Office of Appeals. And, uh, or, and then we have, you know, the GC side also has two other um, divisions. One is includes our contempt and compliance and special litigation branch, our FOIA branch. Um, and so there's, there's plenty to do at the agency. You just have to figure out what may be of appeal to you, but certainly I welcome I welcome you apply. And of course, we have, I'm sorry, we have the Division of Appellate and Supreme Court, which actually enforces the board's <laughs> orders when they when they come, and that's on the, the general counsel side as well. Great, thanks. And, and you know, I'll say on the um, the internships, I extremely had a number of students uh, do NLRB internships over the years, and they, they're about the most amazing experiences that any internships uh, I've ever had students do. They're doing more fascinating, high, more advanced work than I've seen any, anywhere else, so highly recommend those. Uh, here's a big question that I'm going to uh, check out for all of you, and you can take turns answering. The question is, has there been a shift in the employer-employee or labor management relationship as a result of COVID-19? Uh, are you noticing any trends amongst industries on that? So what shifts have you noticed in the labor management relationship as a result of COVID? Sharon uh, uh, McFerrin, do you want to uh, uh, take a first stab at answering that? I'll actually maybe pump that one over to Gwen. <laughs> Gwen was in practice um, during part of the pandemic. Um, she, she might have a better perspective on that than I do um, from, from the board's perspective. Gwen, do you want to chime in on that? Or? Yeah, I'd be glad to. Um, yeah, so before my board life, um, yes, I, from March of 2020, um, you know, like all of us, we were engaged in figuring out the changing regulations, local and you know, state and federal and about um, the pandemic and just everyone getting adjusted to it. So I would say that, um, you know, there's probably not one answer that fits all um, because a lot of it, I think, is industry um, based. Um, but I would say that to the extent that um, employers were um, had their staff coming and employees coming to work. Um, in many instances, and actually, you know, not staying at home, um, that they really did have to engage with um, employees, um, you know, in a way that was not done before. Um, and so I think both in union settings and certainly, and, you know, so certainly in union settings and to some mm -hmm. extent probably in non-union settings. I mean, we all, you know, so I do think there's been, a shift in terms of, you know, of, you know, really kind of, you know, some problem solving um, issues to try to figure out how to um, address issues. I mean, there are, you know, certainly there were issues, circumstances, I mean, um, where, I mean, some of them resulted in board decisions where um, there were unilateral changes, employers, you know, just were faced with a lot of economic challenges and, you know, they were, you know, uh, permitted to make some changes that they were make, maybe were not, would otherwise not have been able to do, but for the fact that there was a pandemic. Um, but, um, but, you know, I think a lot of that was driven due to the crises that were at hand, both health and safety issues, as well as economics. So, um, I, you know, I think, it, you know, there was, a, a, I would say generally there's, there was probably a bright, a, much of a bright light in that area, but, you know, we certainly know a lot of s stories where there were not bright stories, uh, where workers were not being treated with respect um, and not um, being paid, you know, well, um, even in the instance where employers were working, you know, had, had jobs for them. Um, so um, I think it was, you know, it was, it was definitely challenging times, but I think on balance, there was, a, you know, an uptick in terms of, I think, you know, labor management cooperation. So Alex, I'd like to yeah. offer, as someone who has practiced um, labor law from the management side, a couple of two observations. One, I do think um, we are going to be seeing a trend around the gentrification and stratification of work. 
and how work is performed, who has to show up, and who can choose their work location. Um, and I think that's going to create more divides um, in employers and within our society. There are certain people who, who have certain um, jobs that require them to physically show up and do their work and, and to put themselves, particularly in the period of pandemic, um, in, in harm, harm's way. And there are others who, because of the nature of their jobs, have the, the luxury of negotiating how and where they perform their work. And so I think that we're going to have to resolve those issues um, um, based on an industry level and um, at an employer by employer level. Um, I also think that this question about how and where we perform our work will really challenge us to think about our mission and and what do we, why do we do what we do? Um, and as we try to think more, um, as we try to examine how to take advantage of what we've learned through the use of technology. And so I appreciate General Counsel Bruzo's comments about the values of in-person in certain adjudicatory um, scenarios. And um, I think the pandemic is going to force all of us to interrogate those assumptions. Um, and it'll be interesting where we land um, and how long this trend of um, alternative uh, delivery models for work, where that will, when that trend, where that trend will lead us and for how long. Um, what's the learning from that? And I'd also be interested in what researchers and scholars in this field um, have to say about that, right? Um, um, so th yeah. those are a couple of observations about, I think, the impact of the pandemic on employer-employee um, management labor relationships. Yeah. It's, 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 yeah. From a researcher standpoint, I was struck by the stat that only 13% of Americans in last July did any sort of remote work. Uh, it's a BLS stat, and uh, it correlates heavily with um, in terms of who gets access to uh, sort of more privileged groups um, tended to have more access. So, uh, General Counsel Bruzo. Yeah, no, I just wanted to say so. So, in response to Donica, I mean, certainly, I think that there's plenty of work writ large that you know, can be done virtually and, and some that, you know, can't, um, at least not as effectively as, as we would like. And then, you know, you got to find the balance. But in terms of, um, you know, just following up on what Gwen said, I can tell you from our experience, um, and of course, we get the charges filed. So there's some workplace issues that have percolated and then they file a charge with us. So we actually have seen on the general counsel side during this moment, a lot of good labor management relationships uh, develop. Um, but there have been situations where management has kind of gone beyond the kind of exigent circumstance and started like unilaterally implementing terms and conditions without bargaining with the union, using the exigent circumstance as, a, as the rationale where in fact, I mean, pandemic is certainly an exigent circumstance, but at a certain point after you get past that initial hurdle, there is still an opportunity for bargaining over certain impacts. And, and um, there have been times where that hasn't happened and we have found violations based upon a unilateral implementation of certain working conditions. I will also say on the, what I consider to be the bright side is that I think employer employees have found their voices particularly when it <laughs> focuses on their health and safety and protections. Mm -hmm. And we have seen quite a bit of uptick in yeah. protected concerted activities mm -hmm. around health and safety issues. Uh, and I think it's been an eye, it's been an awakening moment for employers, particularly those in non-represented facilities to know that a, the NLRA protects protected concerted activities such as protesting or otherwise engaging in collective action 
um, to, to deal with health and safety issues. Um, and so it's been a, a good learning moment and it's also for both employers, I think, and also for workers writ large to, to know that, hey, they have rights and, and, and one of their rights is to engage with one another to try to improve their circumstances. And I'd say that's an acceleration even of kind of the seismic shifts in, in the, you know, we had seen some of these impacts already from the seismic shifts in the, na the nature of employment and kind of the way that the economy functions. I think that had already kind of started moving workers a little bit towards this more kind of collectivist perspective, our problems are joint problems, our problems are shared mm -hmm. problems. And I, I completely agree with Jennifer. I think that that has, that, that there, the pandemic has accelerated that kind of collectivist mentality a little bit amongst workers that we are all in the same boat here. And sometimes it's not a great boat and we need to, you know, it, and it's, 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 it's we have, but we have the power to join together to fix it. Mm -hmm. As yeah, you mentioned, the, um, uh, the health and safety uh, uh, concerns, because it seems like that there's a whole new category of places where health and safety concerns exist, right? Not your sort of deep sea fishing or hard rock mining or the traditional dangerous jobs, but now grocery workers, right, is sort of a health and safety issue. And, and that, that seems a real change. And, and the sort of Section 7 kind of uh, actions in like warehouses around health and safety and COVID. And that, that seems new. I don't remember hearing that before. Yeah, I, mean, I think the concept of essential um, workers has uh, you know, during the pandemic has um, really um, expanded who was important, um, you know, and so, yeah, grocery workers were considered, you know, were considered to be essential workers when, not that they, not that they didn't have their challenges um, during the pandemic, certainly many of them did, but the concept was, you know, much broader. I mean, in healthcare, it wasn't just the doctors who were considered to be essential, but everybody was considered to be essential, whether it was a housekeeper um, or, you know, a CNA, um, lab techs. I mean, everybody needed to, you know, was essential. Um, and so that was a definition I think that has helped to, um, for workers to, to, you know, have a sense of value. Um, but as Jennifer and Laura have said, you know, workers also become more empowered to, um, you know, to be able to advance their issues, and especially in the health and safety area. Well, ILR, we're, we're actually, I'll just put a little plug. We're actually now tracking uh, labor actions, a uh, strike and other uh, actions. We've got a new ILR labor action tracker. And already we're seeing, we only started this in, in May in terms of publishing it. And uh, just October, we see three times the number of uh, um, uh, disputes as over the last period. So uh, the strike tober that people are talking about, we're actually seeing that in the data. So um, that'll, I'm sure, will be coming your ways uh, to the NLRB in terms of uh, dealing with some of the these uh, complex legal issues that arise out of it. Um, so I'm going to uh, throw back to Donica to finish up, uh, to wrap up, because we are near the end of our time. But uh, 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 thanks for asking to answer those uh, really interesting questions from the audience. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much for uh, joining us today. We really appreciate those of you who joined us um, for this webinar. And I'd like to personally thank um, each of our uh, panelists, uh, member uh, Wilcox, uh, Chairman McFerrin and General Counsel Abruzzo and Dean Colvin. Um, as I mentioned earlier, those of you who are interested in exploring um, the other panels that will be sponsored by the President's Council on Women, um, we encourage you to visit the website um, that uh, had information about this um, uh, presentation. Um, and you can also, as we mentioned, view this panel discussion again and share it with friends and colleagues. So, so thank you for our sponsors of, of this event and our participants, and we hope that you will join this group at the uh, next two presentations. Thank you, Danica. Thank you.